All right, so uh, afternoon, everyone. My name's um, Alex Pocken. I'm here to talk about 5G for media. Uh, so I'm head of wireless technologies at DTG. So we, uh, we do a lot of work in this area, looking at the kind of future of TV distribution. Now it's going to move away from perhaps uh, your kind of traditional high power, high tower, transmit into a, to an aerial on your roof kind of thing. So uh, we're doing a lot, of, a lot of work in this at the moment. So um, DTG, we're an uh, industry collaboration group. So we're kind of an industry association for TV, we're a members organisation. Uh, our, our ultimate aim is to try and bring everyone together to ensure when new kind of features of TV get rolled out, they're all in one kind of standard rather than having a kind of VHS and Betamax type scenario. If everyone's rolling out UHD, it's going to be the same. So you're not tied into one set of standards or one set of products or, or that kind of stuff. So. Uh, so that's generally what we do, and we produce a set of standards called the D-Book, and uh, these are all our members, you can see the kind of traditional broadcasters, BBC, Channel 4, etc., all the TV manufacturers. Um, we've also got people like Fastly, uh, now these are kind of internet-based uh, organisations looking at delivering TV over the internet. Uh, why they're members is because now we're looking at more and more content being delivered on the internet, so we're looking at how that's all going to transition over to uh, one day everything on the internet, and you wouldn't have a kind of TV network anymore. So that's the uh, kind of aim. I'll just finish my tea. Um, so uh, ultimately, um, all of this work supports these platforms. So when you buy a TV, it'll either show free view or free sat or whatever. And if your TV uh, is sold in the UK, then it would have gone through our testing facilities, been tested against our standards. So we, we test every TV in the UK, basically. And, uh, and that ensures that the consumers know what they're getting and the retailers know what they're selling and, and everyone's kind of happy, basically, at the end of the day. So that's the kind of set scene of what we are. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about today is, um, well, mobile technology in general, just to kind of give some more background on that, what, where it's evolved from, what is 5G and how is it different to 4G, and then why is that interesting to broadcasters in the TV and the radio world? Why would they be interested in looking at some other way of delivering TV? Uh, and then also, what other use cases are there? Because it's not just about free-to-air TV, there's all sorts of interactive solutions and various uh, other services that can be delivered. Uh, and then we'll look at some next steps. Uh, so, evolution of mobile technology. So, you may remember, well, now we're looking at 5G. Back in the day, it was 1G, and, and that was just an analog phone system. So, you may remember some of these kind of gadgets knocking about, um, kind of huge mobile phones. I remember our... Uh, Janitor at school had one of these mobile phones on it where you had to carry around in a suitcase for the battery. Um, seemed a bit overkill at the time, I'm not sure who was phoning on it. But, um, but yeah, these, these were kind of early systems and these were just for voice, nothing else, you couldn't text or anything like that. Uh, and then, um, game changer was 2G where suddenly everything became digital and then all of a sudden you got data. And what that, you may remember, these, this was my first mobile phone. Uh, for the Nokia 3210 and all of a sudden you could send text messages and that was where the difference was and now it was all of a sudden everyone wanted one. It was a really accessible way of contacting your, your friends and when I went to university everyone had one of these and, and that was the way you, you con there wasn't any more queues for the payphone. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so as I said, this came about with the advent of data uh, and digital uh, telecommunications and, uh, and that meant everything was suddenly at large scale. So now all of a sudden everyone's got a, a mobile phone. And uh, it's not just a case of it being 2G, then 3G. There's, there's transitions all the way through this, and um, uh, the, the technology is constantly evolving. You may see on your phone sometimes it says E or Edge or something like that, and that is essentially 2.5G, so your phone still goes onto this kind of networks now, and that was like a bolt onto 2G to try and encourage more data throughput. And then through that we started seeing things like cameras and uh, picture messaging and stuff like that starting to take off, and then it came to, to 3G. So... As I said, when we came to 3G, then all of a sudden we got cameras, we got videos being shared, people are starting to use their phones for work, you do your emails, your calendars, your contacts, it becomes a part of your everyday life now. And uh, yeah, the, the, all of a sudden, uh, it's a central commodity. Uh, it's not just something that's kind of frivolous and you're kind of using to, to just send messages to whoever you, you need it for everyday, everyday use. Uh, and then... We started to move towards 4G, and as I said, there's kind of constant evolutions. There was other bits added on for 3G, and then basically through that enabled the, uh, the iPhone, the smartphone. And then now you've got apps. You've got apps to cover everything from your banking to your, to your tickets, for your mobile, for your, for your trains, for your taxis, for your food delivery, for everything. So all of a sudden, your life is run on a, on a mobile phone. I found this one on the internet. This is a first iPhone, £12,000, if you want to have a look at that. Um, free postage, though. Um, <laughs> 
But yeah, um, so this was 2007 this came out, um, which doesn't actually seem that long ago, to be honest. But uh, yeah, so then everything changed then at that point. Uh, and then we went on to 4G. So uh, 4G, 5G, 5G is going to be more um, about everything being connected, not just your phone, not just your devices. So it's going to be about healthcare, automated cars, uh, smart homes, all your utilities. Everything's going to be interconnected on one network, apparently. Um, that's the that's the kind of hype anyway. That's the talk about it. So it's it's it's, it's a step change again. You can see all of these generations of step changes. This is a step change again where we're not just looking at you know, your handheld device. We're looking at everything around you and your day-to-day -day life being connected via 5G. Uh, and how is this different from 4G? So you can see, I mean, um, generally when a new technology comes out for mobile technology, it's always about, okay, it's blazing fast internet wherever you are. That's always the, the tagline. But uh, And that's true with 5G. You're going to get more data rates, higher, higher throughput. You can download your videos a lot quicker or whatever. But... More with 5G, it's about the perception of it always being available. So um, we've all been in a kind of situation where you've been at a music festival or a stadium or whatever, you can see full coverage on your phone, but you can't get on the network. And that's because of the capacity constraints. And 5G is about allowing more users on at the same time. It's, a, it's about um, more responsiveness. Uh, the latency here is a kind of round trip time from you requesting something to it coming back to you. Uh, and that's been reduced by a factor of 10. So it's going to be more responsive, more available, uh, higher throughput, and you'll just feel like you've always got connectivity, whether that's on the train or car or wherever you are. Um, is that going to work if I stand up? Yeah. Um, so in summary, if someone's talking to you about 5G, they'll always show a, a 5G triangle, and all of these kind of technical aspects form three kind of pillars of why 5G was introduced. It was about extreme mobile broadband, so faster, it's about critical machine communication, so this is the responsiveness, uh, and I'll explain some more of the use cases around that shortly. And it's about Internet of Things, uh, massive mach machine type communication. And um, Internet of Things is, like I said, everything in your home is going to be connected, everything in your car is going to be connected, and all that kind of stuff. And these have a, their own requirements separate from just fast downloads. They need to not drain the battery. They're only often sending little bits of data, so it needs to be simple technology. So. There's all these different requirements. Oh, that does work. Cool. Um, but these are just targets. It's not necessarily that you're going to get all of this stuff in one place all the time. Uh, you, nor would you need to, probably. For, 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 it's about tailoring it for specific requirements, really. Um, and it's worth pointing out there's no targets for network kind of coverage and capacity. This is all a kind of, in theory, if you're in coverage, you can get all of this. But it's not necessarily going to be the case that all of a sudden everyone's going to roll out networks all over the country because it's still going to cost a lot of money. So you're going to it's going to see a long time before this kind of takes off, really, in a pervasive way. So there's all sorts of different use cases. Uh, as I said, with the fast mobile broadband, you're going to, have to see things like more virtual reality uh, use cases coming into to play, whether that's gaming or tourism or, or whatever the case may be. Um, downloading your UHD videos, delivering UHD videos, uh, cloud computing. So things can move away from a desk-based application to the cloud. I know that's happening more and more in kind of desktop kind of work environments, but for a TV production environment, for example, that could also happen, and that's massive amounts of data going up to the cloud. Um, and then we've got all of these Internet of Things applications, and then for the ultra-low latency stuff, the, the responsiveness stuff, we're going to start seeing things like automated vehicles, um, and they need to be responsive, because obviously if a pedestrian walks out on the road, it needs to quickly assess that and stop the car. And remote, remote surgery is one of the use cases often talked about. So, you know, someone could be in a, perhaps a war situation and someone could be operating on them from, from London or wherever, um, uh, which doesn't sound too appealing, but uh, potentially that's what could happen. And then obviously public safety, they need to get access to the network and, and quickly. So there's all of these different things that are going to be tailored um, through a 5G network. So what's the exam question say? Well, why, why, okay, that's all very interesting, um, but why, why would the, t the TV industry be bothered? So um, as I'm sure you're all aware, viewer behavior is changing. You know, you expect to be able to watch what you want, where you want, whatever scenario you're in, um, multiple devices at the same time, different devices, you know, uh, people expect a lot more from their TV experience nowadays. And um, it's becoming more globalised. I mean, the term fangs is always used for the kind of over-the-top providers that we're seeing now, Apple TVs and all this. That makes it sound kind of somehow onerous, but at the end of the day, they're providing a valuable service which is disrupted to the TV industry, but it's uh, something that a lot of people uh, use on a daily basis. And 
the thing with these is it means TV is becoming more globalized. Um, these guys aren't interested in local TV content, local news and all that, maybe cultural content and stuff. They're interested on a global kind of blockbuster type production. And uh, it means their production scales are way above anything that the kind of normal traditional broadcasters have got. So it's difficult for the TV, the kind of traditional TV broadcasters to compete in this environment. Um, they can't, like the BBC can't exactly just raise the, uh, the license fee or double it or whatever. Um, and then we see kind of thing, you know, there's often comments like this. My kids only watch YouTube on their iPads. They nobody watches TV anymore. And that's a kind of subtext of that. And, and while it's certainly true that um, this is a kind of comparison 2017 through to, to now, more or less, of the kind of viewing time of individuals whilst they're watching uh, on, on free-to-air TV, public service TV, and you can see it's a kind of steadily dropping, and that's because people are dipping into all sorts of other services and formats. Um, but there's still a kind of constant requirement for, for the broadcast, for the, for the mainstay of TV, which is broadcast and free-to-air TV as well. And that's, it's just perhaps more of it is moving on to, a, to uh, individual channel, channels now and services. And this is what I mean. So when you've got a, a large live event at scale, live sport is a prime example, live news, uh, like your kind of Saturday night entertainment type shows which are live, everyone wants to watch them at the same time. You don't want to catch up on it because you're going to know the result or whatever. Uh, you want to watch it there and then. Everyone wants to watch something at the same time. In this case, the internet is not good because if you try and uh, do that um, for everyone, say if a million people wanted to watch a football, that's a min million individual signals being sent out to those people. If you broadcast it, that's one signal being sent out and everyone can receive it. And where we say all problems was in the World Cup, uh, the BBC uh, launched a UHD over iPlayer, which was live, and uh, it tapped out uh, about 60,000 viewers. It couldn't get any more than that uh, because the costs were going up exponentially to provide the network throughput. The delays were getting too large. You know, people could hear the pub cheering down the road 30 seconds before they saw the action. And the experience wasn't good. So uh, in these cases, this is why you still need a kind of baseline of broadcast services to complement the internet services. Uh, so what does this mean for free-to-air TV? So is it still relevant? Well, how much longer for? What could be replaced with? Um, and uh, what are the kind of milestones in all of this? So here's a little clip about trying to explain where 5G perhaps could come in with all of this. This project is working to make this practical. Most conventional broadcast networks are designed to serve stationary TV sets within their coverage area. They're very efficient for live programs and large audiences, but they can't provide on-demand services. In mobile networks, content is delivered to each mobile device individually. It's a unicast. This is good for on-demand services, but inefficient when many users want to watch the same content at the same time. Today, broadcast networks can't reach mobile devices and mobile networks can't reach TV sets. 5G aims to combine broadcast and unicast capabilities on the same network using both cellular base stations and high power broadcast towers. 5G signals can be received on TV sets, mobile phones and in cars. Can 5G used in a single frequency network on broadcast towers provide both the live television and on-demand content at the same time? This was the challenge. So, yeah, that's, that's the kind of, perhaps, a vision of the future. You've got one network doing everything. Wherever you are, you can watch your live football, your live news, whatever, on whatever device. There we go. So uh, there's all of these kind of things that could come along with that, new formats for TV, uh, new production methods, which I'll explain a bit more about that and what that will bring, new types of services, extended reach. Um, this mouse isn't working very well. Uh, and then this would all require a new network, though. And that's where perhaps we've got... Oh, come on. Sorry about this. I'm going to keep bending over to do that. So new distribution. So, OK, we could do all of this now, but we'd have to get rid of everything that's out there at the moment. All of the TVs would have to change, and people would have to get upgrade all of their systems. So perhaps it's, uh, it's not as easy as we first thought. Um, so as I said, today we've got the kind of status quo. Everything's separate. Um, and, you know, there's a metaphorical wall in between. Uh, and then in the future, everything's combined. Brilliant. And um, as part of this work, there's already work gone into the, to the um, mobile standards to include all of these kind of functionality, this functionality for free-to-air TV in, in the mobile standards. So the main one being, 
you, you don't have to have a SIM card now. Um, if someone made this device, you could just basically buy a phone and it would receive TV. So it's got like an inbuilt aerial and you could get free to air television. And uh, there's also all sorts of other um, technology advances that have gone into the network. And this has been through partnership with the TV broadcasters and us at DTG and the mobile community to try and uh, make the mobile network suitable for delivering TV. But um, why this has not perhaps happened to any scale as yet, oh, hang on, there's also uh, radio as well, I shouldn't forget. The, the BBC are already using this technology up in the Orkney Islands uh, to trial uh, delivery of radio. So trialists got access to mobile broadband, but they could also receive free radio content. And then as well as getting the free radio content, you can get access to the back catalogues and podcasts and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, however, there's some uh, buts. Uh, any kind of network that would build out to deliver this kind of stuff would have to be everywhere and not just... So mobile networks tend to concentrate on the high population areas, uh, you know, you'll often... I'm sure you've been out in the countryside or wherever and you can't get uh, coverage on your mobile phone, whereas TV's got to cover a certain percent of the, uh, the geographic uh, area. And um, it's got to be, uh, have enough capacity for everyone, it's got to be reliant, resilient and all of that and be able to reach everyone in an emergency situation. Um, I think one of the main things as well is there's a specific regulation for TV which uh, is quite onerous and is not in a mobile world. And um, I'll go into that in a sec, but that's really one of the main things holding this back as a, as a kind of service, really. Um, and it's got to be affordable. Um, so uh, a broadcaster at the moment of TV, they deliver their service, they know what the cost is. It doesn't matter whether there's 50 million people watching it or one, one person watching it, it's the same. Whereas in a uh, mobile world, if 50 million people watching it, it might be 50 million times more than if one person was watching it because you'd have to dimension the network as, as it's happening. Um, so there's all these things that are kind of holding it back, really. Um, so at the moment, cellular networks alone and conventionally these are mobile network operators, business models don't meet all of the requirements of a, of a broadcast infrastructure for, for TV, for free-to-air TV, essentially. And um, if you look at the kind of comparison of the two now, this is a TV technology and this is 5G. I mean, most of the things they can both do, you can... You can provide a broadcast service, you could deploy it in various frequencies, you can supply you know, linear TVs like what you're used to with a, with a TV guide. You can provide on-demand TV, but you can't in a normal TV world, um, and various things like that. Where, where the, diff the main difference is, there's no receivers at the minute, so although the technology is in the standards, no one's built a mobile phone that can receive free-to-air TV or broadcast services. Um, there's no one built any networks. Um, there's no regulatory model. And... It's uncertain what the costs are, as I said. A broadcaster needs to know what they're going to be spending to distribute TV. And uh, as I said, the regulation is one of the main issues in this. Uh, with the telecoms world, you can pretty much distribute what content you like, really. Um, there's no rules on who gets that or who sees it, or there's no, you know, you can more or less send what you want, and uh, it's very light touch. In the broadcasting world, uh, there's a massive regulatory burden. TV operators have got to get specific licenses. They've got to adhere to a strict set of rules. Uh, and so a, broad a mobile operator trying to take on all of this kind of stuff is probably not too keen to suddenly become on all of these kind of pressures that they're not used to at the moment. So, uh, yeah, some, some difficulties there. And um, at the moment, on the other side of it, broadcasters get a pretty sweet deal, to be honest. There's the PSB, the Public Service Broadcasters deal. So... Uh, they've got some obligations, as I said, conditions, what you can show, who you can show it to. Uh, you know, you've got to show regional news and all of this kind of stuff. And there's only certain adverts you can show. But in return, there's a must-carry rule. So if you're a TV platform, you've got to carry the BBC. You've got to carry the ITV. And you've got to carry it on a certain order as well. You've got to show BBC One as Channel One. So you get prominence. You, you, you're ahead of the game. You're uh, immediately visible. Everyone knows where, where your channel is. Um, and you get access to the spectrum. So the spectrum is the, the wireless link that sends over the information from the transmitter to your antenna. Uh, the public service broadcast, broadcasters get free access to that, uh, whereas mobile operators have to pay billions of pounds for it. Um, when the 3G auctions happened for the spectrum initially, they paid £23 billion. Pounds. So, um, so, yeah, they get a pretty good, good deal at the moment. Um, so if there's any kind of major way in the change you receive free-to-air TV, public service TV, public service radio, 
it's not about the technology because the technology is already there to support it. It's going to be about creating a business model and a, and a regulatory framework to support it all that's going to bring it around. Um, however, it's more than just public service content to consider. So well, the prediction there from Ovum, mobile will become a primary video entertainment distribution channel. So what that means is you're going to see more tie-ups with uh, you know, mobile operators, Vodafone O2, they're going to tie up with the likes of these subscribers and that becomes part of your, your service, your package, and that's going to be a differentiation for them because coverage is more or less going to be the same for a lot of them. Uh, we're seeing this already, um, obviously BT and EE tied up with the Champions League coverage and on top of that with 5G you're going to get things like these are kind of 360 degree virtual reality interactive type services going to be overlaid on top of just getting access to the, to the content itself. And we're going to start seeing more of a merge of gaming and video. Um, you become immersed in the content. You, Bandersnatch was a show where you could direct where the, where the uh, ending went. And uh, we're going to see more of that as well. So kind of interactive content as well. And um, yeah, so uh, in stadium augmented reality is going to be more of a thing as well. Um, and just due to some of these aspects of the 5G network. Uh, and um, as an example, we have here, this was a, um, uh, a, a showcase that Vodafone put on at Newbury. And uh, what it was is they had Steph Houghton from Manchester City uh, in Manchester, and she was beamed via virtual reality to a, to a meeting in Newbury. And as you can see, that's very realistic and lifelike. And, and that's all a bit gimmicky, which is fine. It explains the point. But... The kind of overall uh, aim of this is you could perhaps have uh, a sporting event taking place in one venue and you can see it in virtual reality in another venue. You could be watching your football team at home when they're playing away or something like that. You could see a music concert uh, from, from many stadiums around the, the country or the world or whatever that's taking place in another one. Um, I mean, that's perhaps a bit far-fetched, but it's, it's the aim of a lot of these things. Perhaps more uh, immediately, you're going to see a lot of AR apps on phone. So you go to a sports stadium, you could uh, point it at the ground and you'll maybe see some stats of the players, you'll see some tactics, you'll see things pop up, uh, you see all of this kind of background information to, to augment the uh, experience that you're having at the football stadium or wherever stadium you're at. And uh, smart tourism I mentioned before, this is already happening. BBC have been running a service to overlay historical recreations um, from your point of view. So if you go to Bath, um, Ro uh, Roman Baths in Bath, uh, and you get a handset, you basically move it around and it immediately shows you in real time what that would have looked like at that location, um, at whatever period the, the museum's from. And uh, why do you need 5G for that? Because you need very high bandwidths to provide the video data to support that. You need 360 degree, uh, video, so it's a lot of content getting sent down to the phone. Uh, and also, it needs to be very responsive. You don't want to move the phone over there and it's still showing what was over there. It's got to be instant. Um, so that's where 5G becomes a game changer. Um, and then production. Live sport, live news. Um, uh, 5G networks can help with this. At the moment, um, if you're producing anything live, you've got to turn up with a bunch of vans, satellite trucks, all sorts of stuff like that. It's very expensive. It needs a lot of forward planning. You can't just turn up to something, perhaps. Um, so uh, 5G can be used to get the content from the location to the production centre, um, taking advantage of a concept called network slicing, which is, at the moment, um, producers need a lot of bandwidth to get all of their video content back to a studio so they might have say 15 sim cards in their camera to, do, to guarantee the access uh, whereas with 5G there's a concept called network slicing which is where you've got kind of one physical network with a virtual kind of overlay on it which is your kind of section of it and that guarantees you certain criteria and that could be tailored for if you're a broadcaster or some industrial application or whatever you can tailor all these different bits of the network through software so that's a real change there and um, just to kind of illustrate the point, um, this is um, a conventional setup for production. You've got cameras somewhere, you've got a transmitter needing to get that back um, to basically a set of outdoor vans, OB trucks, out outdoor broadcast, and they send that by satellite to a studio who then add in all of the kind of graphics and the overlay and the produce it and send it out for further distribution. Uh, so the concept of 5G would be that you get rid of that and you have that. 
So it uh, seems pretty straightforward, right? Um, so this would massively reduce the cost of producing a, uh, an event. And why is that good? Well, there's a short clip here from uh, BT. Uh, it's a busy week here at Wembley. It is the EE Wembley Cup here on Sunday, and that'll be the first live sporting event to be produced remotely using 5G technology. And ahead of that milestone, today between Wembley here and the XL Exhibition Centre over in East London, we've been demonstrating live broadcasts using remote production with 5G technology. here at the EE Wembley Cup. This is the TV compound, which is normally an area that is rammed full of OB trucks and a whole fleet of sporting vehicles. Uh, and it's not today. This is a world's first. We're producing, remote producing, uh, a game over 5G connectivity, which has never been done before. Uh, in that some of the cameras here are all connected back to our Stratford base using a 5G system and being produced by a director who's in our gallery at Stratford. Our network now, the network is over 60% of video, which means actually we have a video distribution network. Here you've got 30,000 predominantly you know, uh, kids between the sort of 6 and, and 16, all sending updates uh, on social media. Quite a lot of um, personal broadcasts, so there'll be lots of people using YouTube Live and um, Facebook Live, um, Periscope, etc. So what 5G allows us to do is there's a technology called network slicing which means that we can create a broadcast grade network. The Wembley Cup's really exciting, you know, the world's first live 5G event covered by BT Sport going out on Spencer FC YouTube channel. The important thing for this is about how we take our audiences to the heart of sport. It's about how we use innovation to be able to do things differently, to be able to do more, to be able to do things faster. 5G is really, really exciting for a broadcaster. It will up the creative opportunity. At the same time, it will drive the efficiencies, which will enable us to do more and better. You know, BC Sport offers a wide variety of different events across Speedway, National League, Women's Super League, all the way up to the Premier League. And I would imagine that in five years, we'll be talking about transforming a huge number of those events' coverage into being 5G contributed, which means we'll have hopefully goals from every single match in those significant leagues. Every single race from the Speedway could be all coming back in real time. Those are then going out either to highlight shows or probably faster onto social and making really interesting programming and lots more of it, bringing fans so much more action than they are enjoying right now. So there you go. So the whole, the whole concept is um, more, more live services, more niche content. It's a lot cheaper, more practical to actually get this, uh, these live, this live information over to your, your devices. Oh, come on, come on again. There we go. So um, when's all this going to happen? So uh, we mentioned some of the previous technologies. And in general, what this is showing is, uh, obviously this was a while ago, but what this is showing is it takes 10 years between different generations of the technology to be developed, and it's 20 years before they are then fully used and at their peak of uh, um, use cases. So 3G is still not at its peak at the moment, even though it's been out since 2000 in terms of the amount of people who are using it. 4G, not till 2030. Um, so for 5G, we're looking at kind of 2026 time where we're really going to see kind of wide uptake of it, and then it won't be at its peak till 2050. Uh, sorry, 2040. Uh, standards have only come out this year and next year there'll be some more standards coming out. So it's going to be a while before we see a wide, wide uptake of all of these kind of use cases anyway. You'll start to see kind of early things like mobile broadband, you're already seeing that. Uh, but all of this kind of extra stuff is going to be further down the line. So it'll be a while before we see any automated cars. Um, and 6G is already on the way. So uh, this was just uh, the other week. Uh, China start development of 6G having just turned on its 5G. So, uh, true to form, um, you know, we're looking at 2020 for 5G standards. It'll be 2030. We'll see 6G coming out. And I think this is going to be more about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and all this kind of stuff. Quantum computing, I think, is a term that keeps getting banded around. So, um, key kind of takeaways. Um, cautiously optimistic, I would say. 5G has a lot of potential uh, for the broadcast industry. 
Um, it can bring more live events to viewers, streamline the process of production, and a lot of new services as well, whether they're interactive or, or uh, virtual reality or whatever. Um, but as a replacement for traditional TV networks, it's probably going to be some way off. Uh, it needs to hold. It's not just the technology that's holding it back. It's probably the uh, it's the use cases and the uh, regulatory models really. Or it's uh, it's uh, remain uncertain, I would say. Um, so uh, I kind of watch this space, I think, for that one. But um, as I said, there's a group of broadcasters and mobile network operators, and uh, we're working together to try and make sure these standards are developed in the right way to support TV in the future. So if it comes to the point where it's not economically feasible to carry on with the two networks, then the standards will be ready there to support um, switching over to a new technology. And uh, yeah, you can download the report there, uh, kind of uh, summarizes a lot of this stuff and has some useful stats in and figures and facts and things like that. Uh, so that's free for anyone who get it. Um, keen to work with anyone who's interested in this kind of stuff. We have a lot of meetings and working groups on this kind of stuff. And uh, as I said, we're working in Europe um, with the European Broadcasting Union to start pushing forward perhaps more trials in this area and see how then we can get an idea of what the regulatory issues are, what the business issues are, and the technology issues. So uh, that's going to be happening over the next year or so. Uh, and yeah, our aim is to produce a coherent approach to this across Europe. And I think that is it. Yeah, that's me. So uh, yeah, I hope that was useful.